Hello everybody, on behalf of Embarcador Technologies, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar with Karen Morton on the title, Best Practices for Deve Developing Optimally Performing SQL. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Shweta Singh and I'm the GoToWebinar organizer for today's event. Joining me from Embarcadero is Scott Walsh. Over to you, Scott. Thank you very much, Shweta, and thank you everyone for joining today. We've got an action-packed one hour. It's chock full of information and we're going to go and probably take a full hour. So um, as Shweta mentioned, the question panel will be open. I will be monitoring those during the um, webinar while Karen has the floor and um, we will take those at the end. If there's anything I can answer, certainly um, during the presentation, I'll do that as well. So without further ado, I'd like to thank Karen for um, hosting the webinar today and over to you, Karen. Great. Thank you, uh, Scott, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, this is uh, round two of the webinar for today. We did this earlier this morning, and as Scott said, uh, uh, we have an action-packed and very full hour for you. Um, so uh, again, my goal will be to uh, leave a, a little bit of time at the end for some questions, and, uh, uh, and if uh, you don't get your question answered, feel free to drop by my blog or send me an email, um, and uh, that's the information you're seeing on the screen right now. Um, I am a, a very proud member of the Oak Table Network as well as an Oracle ACE and have been very fortunate to have uh, collaborated on three different books by Oracle Press uh, uh, in the Oracle genre. And uh, just as a, uh, a side um, for the next day, today and tomorrow, um, the Pro Oracle SQL book actually has a 40% discount code um, that you can use if you go to the APRESS site and you want to buy the ebook version of Pro Oracle SQL. Uh, the code that you see there on your screen, OR4SQ8, um, will uh, we'll give you that 40% discount. So uh, feel free to avail yourself of that or pass that on to colleagues who might be interested. Um, to get us started and to frame where we're headed for, uh, for the uh, bulk of our talk today, I wanted to say a few things about best practices. Uh, and I say best practices with uh, air quotes around them a little bit because I, I tend to question when I see um, or hear the use of uh, best practices, the phrase. Um, in general, the definition for a best practice is a technique or method that through your experience and research has been proven to reliably lead to a desired result. Now that sounds pretty awesome. I mean, uh, the things I like about that is that it says we've had experience and there's been some research done for this technique or practice that, uh, uh, that is leading towards some desired um, result and it reliably leads to that. So best practice sounds like, uh, you know, a pretty awesome thing. And with that definition behind you, I mean, who can argue about adopting a best practice? Well, unfortunately, I think that what happens is sometimes best practice as a marketing term uh, with that definition behind, this, uh, behind it has really good intentions, but the reality of things is that um, best practices in actuality may not make a whole lot of sense because there's a piece of it that gets left out. Um, there was a, a great book called the, the Lean Startup, which was written by a guy named Eric Reese, and in uh, that particular book, Eric um, uh, has this quote, it seems to me that we should strive to understand the context in which we find ourselves um, and then apply the practice which is best within that context. This is where I think the term best practice actually goes astray. It is too easy to um, uh, hear uh, a best practice or read about something that's labeled as a best practice and forget that you need to consider the context. Something that may have worked very reliably and proven to work well in one environment may not work well in your environment or for you. Now there's all kinds of things out there that are labeled as best practice and um, you may have actually experienced yourself where um, something that somebody just said, oh this is definitely best practice, if you do this you're going to be successful, you'll have, you know, great performance or such and such is going to happen, you go and implement it or try it out and it just doesn't work that way for you. And I think the thing that is often missing from our definition of best practices is the concept of context. So what I want to do in, in this particular webinar is to actually 
uh, talk to you guys about things that help us establish the context for developing SQL and your applications. Um, so I'm going to kind of take a, uh, I use the term best practices for the title, but I really think it's about contextual practice, about finding what it is that's going to help you um, understand the context of the situation in which you find yourself in, um, regardless of whether you're developing new code, you're maintaining or improving or working on problem diagnosis for old code or whatever. Um, so I think we want to say we want to consider the context of whatever situation we're in and then make sure the practice that we are looking at is truly best in context of that situation. So maybe my uh, title should have actually read contextual practices for developing optimally performing SQL um, instead of just best practices. But now that we're on the same page, I think we can uh, move forward. Um, I really like this slide. I've used it um, uh, several times in the past because I think this is kind of a, a, a big part of the crux of what contextualizing your situation and uh, what you need to do, um, kind of where it all lies. And it lies in the fact that it really is about understanding something. You know, we can memorize a list of best practices. We can um, memorize definitions and all kinds of things or uh, memorize checklists of uh, all kinds of different things to try, but the bottom line is, is that when you find yourself faced with the need to develop a piece of code or work through a problem, the most important thing is understanding how that thing that you're trying to attack actually works. And your ability to understand it means that you don't have to have all these arbitrary facts in your brain and try to full table scan your brain to find um, you know, the list and go through them trying for what may be um, the, uh, the particular item that works for you. Instead, understanding your um, situation and the context in which you find yourself, if you have that really good deep mental model, I think it makes it very um, more, uh, much more likely that you will find success with, uh, with what you need to do because you'll be able to index access the things in your brain that will help you produce the code and get to the problem resolution that you're looking for in a much more efficient way. So um, in terms of the, the practices that I want to talk about um, that relate to helping you per, uh, uh, create better performing SQL, uh, the very first thing, and it may just sound very rudimentary, but you know, it's about planning first. So many times um, I think that it uh, happens that we just dive right in. We're in, living in a world of rapid application development and users screaming for features and you know, in the business wanting things from you as, as developers and so forth to, to really push you to get in and get busy quickly. Um, but taking the time to actually go through and do things like make sure that you're confident of the list of tables um, that you're going to be working with, any indexes that are available already out there. Um, we're going to go over in a couple uh, of minutes um, statistics in, in more detail. I think understanding what the optimizer is going to be looking at in order to make uh, uh, execution plan decisions for the queries that you write, um, those statistics are just invaluable. And you can equip yourself with um, kind of the optimizer's thought processes and how it does things by equipping yourself with a good knowledge of the statistics of the objects. So again, I'll take you through a couple of examples of what I'm talking about here in the next slide or a few. Um, knowing the, the primary keys, foreign keys, um, constraints that um, are placed on the tables and objects, and how can you leverage constraints to be able to help you write better code. Um, now, in, uh, as an example, um, con with constraints, the optimizer is able to um, uh, kind of collect that information and use it in its decision-making process. If, for instance, you decided instead to place the logic of a constraint in your application code, um, the optimizer can't know about what's in your application code. It only can know what's available to it through the database and what it can get out of the data dictionary. So um, for us to put certain constraints in place, with um, database options, database constraints will actually give the optimizer um, better opportunities and better chances to give us good plans that give us better performance. So knowing what's available to 
you and kind of planning um, where the constraints that are in place can uh, assist you and how you develop things I think is very important. The last few things that are on the screen of what we need may again seem obvious, but getting example output if possible, whether it's a screen layout, um, particularly if you're not the, the front end developer, if maybe you're the back end developer and you're the one who's writing the code to populate things, um, and you didn't really design the screen and how the users will interact with it. Sometimes having those layouts in place um, for you to review as you're developing will help you understand um, uh, how the users plan to interact with the screen and um, maybe give you some clues as to how to best um, attack the way you write it so that you can get the data um, most effectively. Same goes for report layouts and knowing kind of uh, where you need totals and subtotals and grand totals and uh, detail and uh, uh, grouping and all manner of things and how it's supposed to look um, may help you drive how you write your code as well. Um, and then finally, uh, having a, a grip on the expected size of the result set. I think that one's a really important one to know, um, uh, am I expecting to get back just a handful of rows, a handful of data that uh, will satisfy my query or uh, statement's result? Or am I going to be dealing with millions or hundreds of millions of rows and computing totals or doing things like that? And understanding how much data that will be returned and also how much will be dealt with to provide the return is an important aspect of understanding how to go about getting that data back. Um, and then finally, um, and certainly not least of all, is the, the response time. Are there any SLAs? Um, do you have to get um, a response time of two seconds or less, um, do you have to get it in two minutes or less? You know, what are the user's expectations and are there any business objectives that you have to meet with that um, as well? <clears throat> so with those things to consider as you're planning for how to write the code you want to write, you're going to need to gather some of that data. So in order to gather the data, um, I actually have a set of scripts. Now there's lots of tools out there that you may be able to gather this information um, with. What I found over the years is I'm just kind of a script girl and it doesn't matter what the tools are, I can typically get to the data that I want um, through some very simple scripts. I will make these available, by the way, um, uh, with a, uh, a link from my blog and Embarcadero when they post the uh, uh, the a replay of uh, this webinar today, they'll also include that link so in the email they send out to you so that you'll um, know where to go to, to get these if you're interested. But basically um, my script is kind of a one-stop shop. It provides me table statistics, column statistics, including histograms, um, partitioned information. If the table happened to be partitioned, it would show me the partition data and so forth or statistical data. Um, and the key here, though, is not just being able to see it, it's being able to glean some um, information from what you're looking at. So just as a kind of a quick walkthrough here, um, when I run my script called ST for Statistics All, um, and I uh, ask it to tell me about this particular PS Cust address table, um, what I see is that it, uh, it shows a number of rows of a little over 107,000. Um, in uh, 2,200 or so blocks. So I get an idea of how big the table as a whole is. Now one thing I will point out uh, quickly is the sample size. Um, in this case you kind of get a clue as to what the sample percentage was that, uh, that was used when the statistics were collected by looking at that. So if Oracle thought there was a little over 100,000 rows and the sample size was um, uh, 32,000, it was about a third of that. So we could estimate that Oracle um, likely used a percentage of collection of about 30% or so. Um, and that may be meaningful to you as you start to look at the statistics in more detail um, to see if 30% is too much, not enough, you know, kind of how accurate are the statistics in relation to reality. So just something to, um, to, to keep in mind that you can glean by looking at the sample size versus the actual number of rows. Um, the column statistics, basically here it's just a list of all the columns in the table and it shows some of the characteristics of those particular columns. For instance, whether or not they're nullable, um, how many distinct values each of the different columns um, contains. 
and then um, how many nulls there are, and then in the buckets column, the BKTS column, that would give you a, an indication of whether or not a histogram had been generated on the column. And then finally, in that last um, uh, column, we see the low and high values. Now, um, the low and high values is really a, a, a neat statistic from the optimizer's point of view in that it really does um, uh, get involved in computing how much of the data is expected to be returned. So one of those questions that, you know, that I was saying would be a good idea to plan for is like you got to know ex uh, approximately how much data will come back. Um, low and high values actually go into the computation for um, uh, the optimizer to be able to do that, along with the number of distinct values, nulls, and all of that as well. But uh, notice here I've kind of highlighted um, in the low high values column um, this, these fields, address field 1, 2, 3, and so on. Um, here, what I wanted to point out was that the way my script happens to work is that when you look at this data, if there are values in the column, uh, any value at all, it will show you the high and the low with that little bar in between it. Now, if you look at the a number of distinct values in these address fields, you see it says there's one distinct value. You may be tempted to believe that the, the uh, value is null because you're not seeing anything there. But um, in reality, what it is is that this field actually has a constraint on it where it's not null. You see in the null column it says, no, you can't have a null value. So what I can tell by looking at this is that they have actually used a blank, a single space um, in place for their default value for the column instead of allowing it to be null. Now, that's good to know. Um, it's good to know that from a, a query perspective when you're designing a query and you're going out there and you're looking for things. It may actually have some effect on how the optimizer will uh, know how to compute distinct values moving on down the road. Now, in this case, we've only got one value out there, um, so it may not be that um, troublesome or of concern, but it's something that you can um, know. Another thing um, here, as you see uh, uh, in the buckets column, this is the histogram. There's a 254 bucket histogram. Basically what that is um, showing us is that there, the optimizer, I'm sorry, the statistics collection mechanism thought that there was some skew in the CUST ID column. So let's say that there was a CUST, CUST ID 1000 um, or 0000 1000 or something. Um, and, and it had um, a maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, 50,000 rows were uh, that customer ID. So maybe there's one person who's out there buying all of the stuff, but in any case, if that were true, the histogram would allow the optimizer to be able to determine how frequently that particular customer ID occurs as compared to other less frequently occurring customers in the table. And it uses that to um, come up with the cardinality estimates that it designs the plan around. So. Um, Another thing, if you look at the effective date column, here's another default value that you'll notice. Um, notice the low value is January 1st of 1901. So it looks like, um, because again, this column is uh, created as not nullable, um, they have used this January 1st, 1901 date as the default. Now, let's imagine, though, that you are executing a query where all you wanted was to pull um, the data from the first of this year, so 2012. So you basically want three months worth of data out of there. Um, well, the way the optimizer will compute the data requirement for this is it's actually going to look at that low value and the high value. And let's say that it went out and it looked and it said, gee, you've got like 111 years worth of data out there. Okay. Well, is that really true? No. Um, in our case, we've only got data for maybe three or four months, let's say, in the table, or even three or four years. It's a whole lot different than 111 years. So, um, so the computation for how much, what percentage of the data that is going to be returned, it's not really going to compute out to be the, the uh, effective equivalent of three months. It's going to be a lot more than that, or a lot lower than that due to that wide range of um, caused by the default value. So you want to watch out for things like that that you may find that you have to kind of work with in your code to, um, to accommodate when you've got defaults like that. 
If it really is null, you'll see something like this. In this column, it is a nullable column, and you'll notice that the uh, number of nulls um, is basically the number of rows. So, and there are no values at all in the high-low column. That bar isn't there and so forth where I delineate between the low and high value. So again, I, I kind of harp on this a little bit um, long, it may seem, but I think that it's really important to let the data talk to you, and the statistics are the critical feature of that, and I think it's important to wrap your hands around it as you begin to develop and or um, maintain, change, modify existing code. Um, histograms, uh, again, a little more information here that my script provides. And basically what it'll do is it'll tell you, in the case of the first one there, that basically one value, there's one bucket which has 77% of the values in the table. Um, and then there is one other value which has 10% of the values in the table. Um, after that, there's no other value present out of those 183 different values that are accounted for. None of those have a percentage greater than 5% of the total data. So that's the way this particular little output looks, is it's only if it's more than 5% does it show it. So this helps you to see if there really is skew in your data or not. If I were to um, have a histogram but not have any of the values that were greater than 5%, I would consider that really not to be skewed, and maybe that histogram um, isn't needed. So a little bit of extra info. And then the index information I can get what columns um, make up the index. Um, I get the statistical um, data about it that you see in the top portion of there, whether it's a normal index, a bitmap index, a function-based index. Um, I have lots of data here that, again, I can use, hopefully very effectively when I try to design my queries. So again, knowledge is power in this case, and knowing what the optimizer knows um, is extremely helpful to you as you work toward writing um, optimal SQL. Uh, this one is um, a kind of a simple output here because there weren't really any constraints on this table, but I wanted to show it to you. The, this cons or constraint script that I have in this case shows for this particular table there's only a bunch of not null constraints on it. If there were primary keys, foreign keys, and all, all that, you would see that here as well. So again, the script um, is just a tool that I can use to give myself more information so that I'm planning and have all the data I need in order to begin to write the statements that, uh, that I need to. Now, <clears throat> once you have the data and you have uh, the requirements from your user, you know what? Um, the questions are only ju just beginning at that point. Um, but so often we don't ask questions. And I think this is um, often uh, kind of the trouble point or the roadblock that we run into in having good SQL. Um, uh, is we're rushing to get things done, and we may assume that we already know everything we need to know, and we don't ask questions. We don't ask questions of, um, of the users that have you know, presented us with this request, or the business, or you know, however you are handed, whether it's through a set of specs, or what, ha uh, what have you, a verbal request, or uh, uh, any method. Um, assuming that you know everything about it, to start with could be kind of dangerous. And um, I, I read um, and heard a presentation uh, some time ago by uh, Steve Bezos of Amazon, and he um, talks about uh, the, um, the great benefit of asking five questions. And I, I guess he picked five as a number because he found that for him that was one that seemed to be pretty effective. But you ask a question, you ask another question, ask another, ask at least five questions that kind of build. You get an answer back for one, and you ask something about that, and then you ask it again and ask again something else. You're trying to build as much information as you possibly can, and I think that's a really effective technique. Um, one reason, though, why we often won't ask questions is because we fear looking stupid. You know, we're, uh, we don't want to seem ignorant. We want people to know, uh, think we know what we're talking about, and asking questions we're afraid may kind of tarnish that image. But I think it is just a, a fabulous thing. It's a way to engage um, the, the people that you're trying to provide the, uh, the work for um, and making sure that you're doing what they want instead of just making some assumption about it and delivering the actual result, not just what you perceive is the result. Um, and again, the whole I'm, I'm 
uh, I'm in such a rush to get things done that questions would slow me down, you know. So I don't want to stop to take the time because I've only got a limited amount of time to do something. So um, taking them, taking a little bit of time to do so, I think, is a great benefit. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So questions bottom line are going to allow us to check our assumptions to get a better appreciation of what we're dealing with so that we're poised and ready to actually deliver um, truly what's being asked for, um, not just what we think is being asked for. And I'll add in here my favorite quote from Tom Kite, tune the question, not the query. Now, I think this is uh, uh, directed a little bit differently than um, my whole ask questions thing, but um, uh, it's related. Um, when you are looking at code, particularly that's already been developed, the hesitation for most people, particularly if it's complex SQL, is that you want to kind of touch it as if it's radioactive. You know, you're afraid that the uh, the query is going to break, um, and you know you've got to get in there and do something to it, but you don't really understand. Um, kind of how it's really functioning and doing what it's doing. All you know is that it's coming back with the right answer. So um, the better part of valor in this case is often um, stopping and taking a moment to ask several questions to find out, well, what is this thing actually supposed to be doing? You know, um, And it may be that what it was doing originally and what it needs to do now has evolved to the point where you could you know, kind of trash whatever's there and start over. So I think focusing in on what you're trying to um, accomplish and not the code that's already in place that someone else, is, else has written um, uh, will give you a, a really a better starting point. So you're tuning the question, not the query. Now what this means is that there's a big piece or element to all this where we need to really understand how our query should answer um, these, the questions, um, uh, like how is it going to populate the screen? How is it going to produce the report? Um, so how are we going to get our result? And that's where um, I like to say it's not about the journey uh, or about the destination, but it's about the journey. Um, focusing on how, not just on what, I think is a key um, uh, element. If all you care about is getting the right answer to the query, that is certainly important. But how you do it, is also a critical piece if you want your SQL to provide optimal performance. I mean, in, in the example the photo is demonstrating, you can accomplish what the task requires, but you may not care about how it gets done. But in the end, is that really what you want? If you've taken the time to, to um, not only do the job, but to worry about the process, about how it's doing the job, um, I think the result is usually um, a more efficient, more effective um, outcome. So <clears throat> how you do something is really and truly just as important as getting the correct result. Um, for example, I've got two little code snippets here and I'll just speak to each one of them. I didn't give you the whole query because they were quite long, but this is an example um, which I see in code very frequently. Um, you see it in canned applications, you know, generated um, code through report generators. You see it in, you know, online um, uh, application queries and things like that. You see it everywhere. In this case, it's uh, where you want a, uh, an effective date in a table. You want to pull back rows that are the latest and greatest. So the table is actually storing um, multiple rows where um, uh, certain pieces of information were effective on a certain day. And then over time, you're going to get different rows as things change. So what you really want when you query the data is you want the latest row. So you're looking for the, the highest or max effective date. And this query will do that. Um, but what it is also going to do is that for each row that is being tested through the WHERE clause, so let's say I had 100 million rows that were um, kind of being processed through this WHERE clause, 100 million times it would have to actually check and see uh, what the max effective date is. Now surely we get some kind of reuse and Oracle will help us optimize that, um, but um, uh, the kind of simplistic way of looking at this would be if I had to pass across 100 million rows to determine if they match the criteria in the WHERE clause, it is possible that 100 million executions of that select max query may have to occur. Okay, so. 
Um, given that, it could be quite expensive. Get a row, execute a query, get a row, execute a query, and so on. Okay? And that's, again, if this is executed a certain way. So what if I wrote it like this? In this case, I'm using an analytic max. Now, in this case, instead of reading the table once and then perhaps having to go hit it again in that, um, that subquery in the where clause, here um, the syntax would allow Oracle to basically make one pass over the data, compute the max effective date, and then and use that in an inline view, and then simply pull out the rows from that computed set of data where the effective date equals the max effective date. I get the same answer in both cases, but what's the difference between the two? Well, in this case, the first method takes about a minute and a half, and it does millions of buffer gets. So it's um, having to revisit the buffer cache over and over and over to pull um, uh, information back. The second method, however, with the analytic, this method only took about seven seconds, and it used less than 50,000 buffer gets. So the amount of work the, um, the response time has, is significantly less, the amount of work is significantly less using the second method. So now what I don't want you to do is say, ah, best practice, you know, I always need to use this analytic max function, okay? No, <laughs> contextualize in this case. What you want to make sure that you're doing is evaluate your options. So in this case, um, as we're looking at different ways to do things, um, I could try both of these and see what my results are, okay? Um, because it, you may find that under certain circumstances, the first way, the first method, works just as well or better than the second. So you just have to do it in context of what your query needs to accomplish. Okay? Another great thing to do is play what if. You need to ask questions about, well, what if there's more concurrent users, more users running this same thing over and over and over at the same time? Imagine month end and you've got lots of people that are all running these big reports or you know, trying to do closing activities, and most of them are doing very similar things. So is that possible um, that it could have an effect when you've got lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of users doing the same thing um, at approximately the same time. And you can play some games with, with that. Um, what if the data volume increases? What if you uh, don't have 10,000 rows, but you've got 10 million rows? Um, would that make a difference in how I write the query, how I formulate the query, how the optimizer actually produces the plans? Um, what if certain database parameter values change? Okay. All these are what ifs. They're, you don't know um, what could change in the future, but what you can do is play around thing with things in the, uh, in the short term, in the now. So a lot of times using hints to force a plan to use different operations and see what happens is a really neat way to test some things. Um, I will frequently use cardinality hints to say, um, you know, table X has 100 million rows with my cardinality hint to try to see what the optimizer is going to do in that particular um, uh, situation. So will it change the plan order of operations? Will it change the access methods? You know, it's, uh, it's a way to play games with it, and I think that's part of that what ifing. Um, try it with full scans. Try it with indexes. Try it with different tables in different orders or using different methods like nested loops or hash joins or so forth. All of that can be a great tool to helping you discover um, uh, what could happen under certain circumstances. And you know, try the different syntax alternatives. Just because you got a hammer, not everything's a nail, right? So if you've become really fond of subquery factoring, for instance, and you like with clauses, you know, you really like the way that looks, um, and you've gotten um, kind of attached to it, that may not mean, and you've had good results with it, it may not mean in every single case that's going to be the best thing to do. So, um, but try things. Try different things. Don't get stuck in, uh, in a rut, so to speak. Okay? Um, I'm a huge believer in code instrumentation. I think it is extremely important to make your code um, uh, measurable and monitorable uh, because, as this quote says, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So, and I just think that is so true. There are often, uh, uh, as we um, put things into production and we're working on things, or even as we're developing them, we'll find there's really two types of performance problems. 
Um, one, response time problems, right? It's the stuff that's running slow. It's pretty obvious. That thing is um, uh, not performing up to par. It may take five minutes when it should take five seconds. Or it may be something less um, insidious as that. It may be something that, well, it's taking eight seconds and it should only take four, okay? Well, people can live with eight seconds, right? You know? Well, those are the kind of things that um, are inefficiencies that may not be response time problems yet, right? Because what you're going to find is that you've got um, these potential areas for trouble to pop up. And how you instrument your code can actually um, be a big key in how you deal with that if those inefficiencies are out there and they do pop up as problems. Um, so what I believe is that you need to be able to attack these inefficiencies that aren't yet problems that are standing out to people. You don't got people, you know, banging on pots and carrying torches and, you know, calling you in the middle of the night about this stuff, but it's a potential problem out there. So as an example, what if you've got a nightly job that takes three hours to complete? Um, and it should take two, but, you know, nobody really cares. It's the middle of the night. You know, the user's coming in the morning and it's done and all that. But, um, you know, why should you care? Okay? Why do you care that it's running a little bit of extra, you know, time when nobody else seems to care? Well, the bottom line is any waste has an associated cost with it. A cost in the uh, on the software development side, a cost in the what happens if it's a problem uh, side. Your total cost of ownership is going to escalate the more waste that um, is present in your code. So waste is, you know, when it's out there, it's going to make other stuff go slower. So if you don't have any contention and it's running slow, it may not be um, visible or be a problem. But as an example, I had just recently with a, with a customer. We had a um, process that was running slow, um, and a normal nightly job that usually ran within a half an hour, it took several hours for it to complete, and it actually didn't finish on time in the morning before it was ready to be done when the business users were expecting to use it. It wasn't that thing that was bad. It was this other process that had kind of gone astray. And tracking that down and figuring it all out, that guy actually caused our fast stuff to get even slower. So inefficiencies are basically trouble spots. It's just trouble waiting to happen. So um, being able to quickly identify that by using instrumentation is an extremely important um, way that you can help yourself um, when you write SQL, make it monitorable, make it measurable so that you can get information quickly um, both in the event of a problem and ahead of time. You can be proactive. You can collect response time data. You can cons uh, collect resource consumption data um, and have that. And it really only takes a few extra lines of code. And just by adding that little bit of code into your application, it can help you know where to focus your attention so that, again, when you write your SQL and you put it into place, you have a way to help you um, make it uh, better if need is called for. You can answer questions like, why did it take so long? Because you've got the data, you've got the way to be able to monitor it. What would happen if I did this or I did that? Again, with measurement data, you have the ability to say, well, what if I was able to change that to reduce response time by X amount or re reduce uh, resource consumption by X amount? Um, you can play some games with that so that it help you to know, is this thing really efficient? Is it doing more work than it should? And, you know, and am I done yet? How do you know when you're done? Um, one thing that was asked this morning that I'll just mention here, someone asked, well, how do you know when you're done? Well, I use as kind of a general metric, I use um, number of IOs or logical IOs uh, per row retrieved. And the, the basic formula that I use is um, the number of tables involved in the query, uh, times the number of rows in the result set times 10. Basically what that amounts to is 10 rows per query, I'm sorry, 10 rows per table that you query in the, in the, uh, uh, in the SQL. You want your, uh, to be able to retrieve one row in that number of logical IOs or less. And it's usually fairly generous with that. Um, so that's just a good kind of starting point um, to know if, if you are in the ballpark in terms of resource consumption. But how do you know? Well, if you're doing your due diligence and you're testing and all of that, 
if you've worked on it um, for you know three hours and you've got it from running in two minutes down to two seconds, I would have to turn back around and say, well, how much more work are you going to have to do to get it below two seconds? And how um, you know what's your SLA? What's the business uh, need for that? And is it worth it to spend more time to um, to get it below two seconds? Um, and, and it, you know, is that the most um, a productive thing to do? So um, you can use as a, an example to instrument your code uh, calls to the DBMS application info package, where you can set the module in action and be able to go in and uh, turn tracing on or collect measurement metrics um, for particular tasks that your business cares about. As long as you label them, you can go in and say, "I want to be able to trace for a particular action and what have you." Um, Method R Corporation actually provides a free piece of software called the Instrumentation Library for Oracle, which is a wrapper for DBMS application info. It's a really cool little utility package, um, uh, free uh, for download at the, uh, the URL that you see listed there. So I'd highly recommend you go read up on that if, uh, if you're looking for a, an easy instrumentation solution to, you know, to help you. Um, it's a, a great way to do it. Um, and this is, these are just a couple of Oracle only options. Obviously you can build things into the application side and so forth, but uh, these are uh, a couple of nifty ways that you can do that from Oracle's perspective. And then in the end, it's all about testing everything that you have to do. Test to destruction. You know, test until you blow it up. Make it blow up. Try different things. All the what if games and so forth. It's about not only the functional tests, which are going to um, allow you to know that you've got the correct result, the right answer, but it's about the practical tests, like I, we talked about, where you exercise the optimizer using different hints or what have you to produce plans that change and um, comparing the results and seeing what happens. And then obviously trying to get an idea of what happens under load, whether you have a, um, uh, uh, a product like a load runner or something like that where you um, can script out various amounts of load, or if you have um, uh, an Embarcadero tour like DB Optimizer um, actually gives you the ability to kind of run things in a simulated load environment. There's lots of tools that can help you with that, so um, you want to stress your uh, results of your SQL, of your code, um, as much as you can um, before you release it into the wild. Um, a few things just to show you, uh, you can test with using explain plans. Now most tools will provide you with an explain plan. It's basically what the optimizer thinks is the plan it's going to use when it executes. Now be real clear on that, an explain plan is what it thinks it's going to do. It may not be exactly what happens. So for that reason, I tend to put limited um, uh, faith in what explain plans, explain Plan, huh, I can't speak, explain plans say uh, to me. I prefer to actually execute the query. Um, in this case, I just turned on auto trace. I execute the query. I, again, get the um, execution plan, what actually happened, and I get um, uh, some information about how much work the query had to do in terms of um, logical I.O., physical I.O., and you see that at the bottom. Um, you could also use uh, the gather plans to statistics hint um, or the parameter statistics underscore level set to all um, for your session or your instance. Um, with the statistics being collected for that statement, you can use DBMS X plan package, the display cursor or procedure, and what you can do there is it will return for you the plan with each step in the plan returning not only the estimates, which are the explain plan data, but the actual values. So if you You'll notice here in this example, we see that the estimated number of rows that were to be returned was 574, but the actual was actually closer to 5,500. Um, and uh, the number of, uh, of logical IOs there, as you see, the buffer gets 487,000 or so. But look at the time. Okay, pretty quick to do uh, do quite a few uh, buffer gets, but it was less than a second. Okay. So just to, to clue you in on that, I uh, use the monitor um, uh, hint. The monitor hint is for um, uh, queries that actually run longer than uh, or less than three seconds or so um, uh, in order to pick them up. Usually what Oracle is going to do when you get into Oracle 11, um, uh, 11 2 and above, what you're going to see is that Oracle will automatically monitor queries that are running longer than a few seconds. Um, and you would get this data um, 
uh, already. But in case you're not and you want to guarantee it, you can use the monitor hint. Um, when you do that, you can then use the DBMS SQL Tune package to call the report SQL monitor procedure. And what you uh, can do is say, well, for this particular SQL ID that I just, um, or the SQL statement that I just created via this particular SQL ID, you want to see the report um, of that. You'll notice that it gives me lots of information about when it started and so forth. But you also get global stats, like how long did it take, how much of that was CPU, how much of that was I.O. Um, and you also are able to see things like, ah, in that lower section down there, cell offload, 99.99%. This happened to be an exadata environment. So um, that's why it was so fast, was that it offloaded most of the work um, for the storage cells, into the storage cells. So pretty neat. Um, and then here I just wanted to show you this. this again, this is um, uh, Embarcadero's DB Optimizer product. Uh, I've used this quite a bit, and I really, really like the visual um, element of this. So often ex ex uh, execution plans are extremely complex to read, um, and sometimes seeing them visually with all of the filter percentages and the estimated cardinalities and so forth in place, it's just an incredible tool. Um, to help you be able to quickly spot inefficiencies when you can see big numbers that stay big and you know all the joins and things. So I think this is a really, really cool um, alternative. If you can see something visually, I think it's a really neat thing. So just to recap, the kinds of practices, the things that will help you kind of formulate the context in which you want to write good SQL requires you to spend some time to plan first. That means you're going to need to gather data, understand statistics and constraints and keys and things like that, um, and ask questions about what you're trying to accomplish. And remember to tune the question, not just the query, so that you're focusing on how things get done as much as what gets done. Um, if you're doing that, you may need to play some what-if games. What if things change? What if we have more users, more data, and so on? What might that do to how I formulate my query? And then um, instrumentation, again, critical piece for how do you be able to measure this thing moving forward and be able to quickly identify problems in the event that they occur. Um, and then finally, testing to destruction. The more you can test, the more alternatives you can try out, um, the greater your probability for success in the long haul um, if you've kind of looked at all the options. So what I'll say finally is just never stop learning. I think that's one of the greatest um, things we can give ourselves is the ability to, to continually strive to learn something more and to, uh, to gather more information. So with that, I'm going to say thank you very much for your time, and I'm going to uh, turn it back over to Scott to, uh, uh, for a few minutes. And uh, uh, after that, if we have any questions or so forth, I'll be glad to take those. But once again, everyone, I really do appreciate your time and you being here this afternoon. And I will post the, uh, the PDF of this presentation along with the scripts on my blog, and you'll get a link to that in the follow-up email. So Scott? Thanks, Karen. And while I get ready, would you mind... Um, I had a couple requests in the um, oh, in the question manager about the oh, the discount code for the book. Would yeah. you mind um, going back going on that slide? I'm I'm gonna well I'm gonna take over right now. But when I'm finished, we can go back to your screen. Okay, very good. Go ahead. There, and then we can show that. So and I'll let you take a look at some of the questions in there. But what I wanted to go over really quick was you mentioned DB Optimizer, and we're big into visualization because we've heard you know working with people uh, the caliber of Karen. You know that they have the knowledge, but also to be able to take that knowledge and, and put it down to the to the inexperienced person who's just cutting their teeth on how to tune working with the platforms. That's the the whole um, vision behind DB Optimizer. And so here, DB Optimizer has really four components. Number one is our database profiling. Number two, it's a SQL editor. You can go in and write your own queries. Number three, there's a tuning component, and number four, there is a a load testing. Component. So right here, I'm looking at a profile of my Oracle 11G database, and we can look over time as we've profiled, and we can see the spikes, see what's happening. We can just click and hover in and see exactly what queries are being run at certain intervals. We can look at, a, at an overall picture. We look here at the max CPUs, and we're all about our active average sessions to see where they are and see if anything is violating that. So we can drill in and see, understand, are we um, constrained by the by our hardware or is it really a, an efficient query and then we can drill in and look at that. Um, that's the profile and the other option we have is is the editor. Here I'm writing a, a query 
Uh, I've written it, I've executed it, but if I'd like to tune it, take it a step further, I can right click and select Tune SQL. I've done that already. I have a, a, a tuning job going on right here. Here, as you can see, we've run this through, and I've looked at my data, and I've actually found some information that, that becomes more, um, more, makes the query more efficient. Here, I've found that, that we were missing an index formation. I can go ahead and run this again and let it run to get some of the metrics. So as we do, then we can hop over once we get to metrics and look at, at what Karen mentioned was the visual SQL tuning. So here we're looking at that first example of the query that had the Cartesian join in it. And we can look and immediately see that we've got part of our query is sitting over by itself. Well, that's sort of a, an alert for us, trying to understand why that's over there by itself. There's really no joins, nothing joining it back to the main query. If we'd like to see where uh, objects are referenced, we simply select the object and we're highlighted over here. And for this view, we can double click it and pull it out even further and look at the actual sub queries and the objects that are used within the subqueries. We have index analysis below. If I select the second query that DB Optimizer found, you can see here we're a nice straight line, uh, very linear with the try and maintain the lowest running row count as we process the queries. Again, we can look at the index analysis, uh, table stats, um, column stats, histograms, and outlines. And going back to this overview, I also want to mention, as Karen indicated, the testing part of it and to be able to put different iterations up there and test against different ways. Here we can do that um, from within the tool itself. We can, I'll just really quick just use an example. I can create a custom case. I can bring it in here and I can drop the query in here and I can modify the query and then when I'm finished, I can go ahead and generate cases and let it run and compare it to the original, a, 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 a a iteration that DB Optimizer created or maybe one that I've tested that I've manually created to do that. So a lot of options there. And then lastly, we can go in and do the SQL load facility here. We're going to take this query and we can run it against number of parallel sessions and we can go as many as I believe uh, 25. I've never really gone that high yet. We can do execution and conditions, how many minutes or the sheer number of execution. So multiple ways to do that. And then one last thing I want to mention, and that is when we do have, when we want to do a tuning session, and, and Karen mentioned this about automating your code, the, the SQL statement that you have, that's an easy one, but what about when you want to tune a stored procedure? How many of us have been challenged with tuning a stored procedure? And the first thing we have to do is find out where the problem is. The, query, the procedure has multiple queries, but maybe it's just one query that's the problem. So we can extract and from a database object, we can parse through that entire store procedure, tune each specific SQL statement, and find the one that's causing us problems. Let the let DB Optimizer tune it. We can correct it. We can regenerate, recreate the object, and you're back up and running um, with optimal code. So again, and just some visual um, aspects and the power behind a tool like DB Optimizer. It's part of DB Power Studio. You can find it in embarkadero.com and a follow-up email will. Um, have links to that. So with that, that's my quick um, five-minute commercial for DB Optimizer. I want to turn it back over to Karen, and we can um, let you show, Karen, uh, so that your screen with those codes. Okay, great. Thanks, Scott. Um, here it is. So uh, again, it's code OR4SQ8. We'll uh, get you the 40% discount um, for the ebook version of Pro Oracle SQL, um, and you get that through the apress.com site. I believe it ends up being about a $14 or $15 discount off the price, so uh, um, wanted to thank Apress for, for doing that for us. But uh, um, feel free to pass it around, tweet it, whatever you need to do. It'd be great. So, um, Shweta, Scott, um, I, uh, some of the, I'm not seeing uh, questions on my side, so if you guys had a couple that came through that you want to kind of uh, bounce toward me, I'll uh, be glad to answer those or, um, or whatever we need to do at this point. Well, I think we're probably at the, at the top of the hour here, so we can take some of these and we can go ahead and address them offline. Okay. And maybe great. send them back individually. All right, sounds good. This time, yeah. All right. Well, uh, thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it. So I'm going to pass it back over to you guys. And again, thank you, Embarcadero, for your time and for putting this on. I think it's a, a great thing, and I'm glad to be a part of it. So thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, very much, thank Karen. you Scott. And I will turn it over to Sweta for a final. Yep. 
Thank you both of you for this very informative uh, webinar. For all the attendees, we have come to the end of our presentation. So as Scott and Karen mentioned, for all the questions that have not been answered, you may contact either one of them. Uh, for any questions in regards to the replay, feel free to contact me at shweta.singh at embarcadero.com. If you missed any portion of this presentation, the recording is going to be made available to you within the next few days, um, along with uh, any follow-up uh, items. So attendees and registrants will be getting a recording, as I mentioned. On behalf of Embarcadero Technologies, I thank you all for attending today's event. Thank you.